What would a world without oil and gas look like? How would our lives be impacted if we simply left oil and gas in the ground, as some have suggested? Dark and, and polluted. Um, if, if I could claim that, that coal was a carbon rather than a hydrocarbon, that's about all we would have to use other than whale oil. And if we had the energy consumption we had today using only crude oil, again, the air quality in Beijing would, would be good compared to here. So leave it in the ground sounds fine. Renewable sources uh, exist, but you, you can't replace the amperage, the horsepower, the capability of, of fossil fuels in, in a lot of uses. And so without uh, producing it, leaving it in the ground, uh, you would have exorbitant utility bills, and we would live pretty close to in the industrial age of 150 years ago. Most of us can't begin to fathom a world without electricity, running water, motorized transportation, and all our modern conveniences. Thanks to the Industrial Revolution of the mid-1700s, we are fortunate to live in the age of hydrocarbons, the most abundant, affordable, and reliable energy source on the planet, significantly enhancing our longevity and quality of life. More than 90% of the energy used on Earth comes from fossil fuels, either coal or hydrocarbons, such as oil and natural gas. Coal is a black or dark brown mineral composed of carbonized vegetable matter. It is a powerful fuel, but is highly polluting and can be hazardous to miners' health. Petroleum and natural gas also derive from ancient plants and other decomposed organic matter. However, unlike coal, petroleum and natural gas form when the carbon atoms bond with hydrogen. This powerful chemical combination can catenate or link with other carbon-hydrocarbon combinations to form immensely long chains. These compounds are extremely versatile, not only as a fuel, but as a feedstock to create plastics and other materials that are used to manufacture many of the products and tools we are accustomed to in modern life. Together, oil and gas represented two-thirds of global energy consumption in 2013. Oil and gas is one of the most important, if not the most important, set of fuels offering primary energy to the world. If you look at 2015, where does primary energy come from? And by primary energy, I mean what we use in our cars, what we use for power generation. Electricity is a secondary source of, of energy, not a primary. The primary energy sources are oil, gas, coal, hydro, nuclear, renewables, uh, biomass, and so forth. So if we look at 2015 as a starting point, oil and gas accounts for a little over 50, in fact, 54% of world primary energy use. So really important, the, mo the most important combination of sources. Thanks to ongoing and significant advances in drilling and production technology over the past century, the extraction of these hydrocarbons is providing power to billions of people across the globe. These advances in drilling technology have made consumer pricing for fossil fuels extremely affordable. At eight years ago, I had 1,600 rigs, drilling rigs, out there scattered across the country, drilling for natural gas. And today I have less than 100, and production is up. And that's the benefits of technology in the modern world, not only its use, but its application with oil and gas. Because of these technological advances, reserve estimates for these hydrocarbons are not decreasing, but increasing, enough to sustain our planet at 7 billion people and growing well into the future. Billions of barrels of approved crude oil reserves are technically and economically recoverable in much of the world today, along with trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. In the U.S., production from tight oil and shell gas formations has driven an overall increase in the abundance of oil and natural gas. Proven U.S. oil and liquid reserves are now estimated at around 40 billion barrels. Proven U.S. natural gas reserves are close to 400 trillion cubic feet, enough to last nearly 100 years. At $5 oil, we would probably run out fairly quickly. At $500 a barrel oil, you have all you can ever need. Somewhere in there is equilibrium with the discoveries uh, fostered by unconventional resource extraction, the shales. In oil, we now uh, beat Saudi Arabia in terms of crude oil reserves. And so we've got 50 years at least of crude oil reserves at current prices. Natural gas is even better. Uh, natural gas prices have come down from 
uh, averaging over $13 in 2009 to less than $3 today, and, and we are still oversupplied with at least 100 years of supply of natural gas. And so price is always in any commodity the, the gating factor, but as prices go up and as, it, as technology improves, the, the lifespan of those reserves will just increase. So during my lifetime and yours, we won't run out and our grandchildren, it would be challenged. Advances in multi-stage hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling techniques are enabling U.S. households to enjoy significant savings on energy through lower natural gas prices. In 2012, annual household savings based on a calculation of gas use times, lower prices, was estimated to be 1200 per household. Hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling techniques have slashed oil imports into the U.S., and in 2013, production from U.S. shale oil plays saved consumers between $63 billion and $248 billion in energy costs on gasoline and other refined products. As the chart shows, in 2013, oil prices would have been almost $40 a barrel higher and petroleum product prices for consumers nearly a dollar a gallon higher if oil from shell formations had not been produced using horizontal multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. It's a good thing because global hydrocarbon consumption is expected to grow significantly in the coming decades, particularly in the developing world. This graph shows projected demand under three price scenarios for developed nations, the OECD countries and developing nations, the non-OECD nations. The U.S. Energy Information Agency projects that demand for oil in the developing world is expected to increase even in the face of high prices. In fact, EIA forecasts that the developing world will consume more oil at higher prices, presumably because their own economies are projected to heat up. Demand for natural gas is projected to soar through 2040 in both the developed and developing worlds. Total global demand in 2040 for natural gas is expected to exceed 200 trillion cubic feet. That's a 40% increase. Demand for clean, burning natural gas is projected to grow significantly over the next three decades, even as most other energy sources decline or flatten. Natural gas, on the other hand, is actually a clean burning fuel, so our skies are clearer than those in Beijing. Uh, natural gas has actually eclipsed coal as a primary source of power in the U.S. now. And, and so things run, and we don't live by whale oil because of oil and gas. When comparing hydrocarbons to renewables, it is important to understand the process of turning energy sources into usable energy on a mass scale. The oil and gas industry has been operating for more than 100 years and has streamlined the process to make it efficient, with a highly developed infrastructure to store these abundant hydrocarbons and deliver them to consumers. That makes them reliable, despite periods of volatility. Thanks in large part to advances made in the United States shell revolution, volatility is likely to subside further. Today, the U.S. is now the swing producer for crude oil. We can add production capacity faster than any country in the world. We grew production in 2014 by 1.4 million barrels a day for that year, which is the most any country in the history of the oil business has ever drilled. And so I, I understand that there will be volatility of commodity prices. We went from $100 uh, in, in June of, of 14 to $27 this past February. And then it rose another 70% uh, from that 27 number before entering a bear market. So oil prices are volatile, especially at the cusps. But the swing producer now being the U.S. and the efficiencies wrought in the U.S. exploration and production scenario actually means that we'll be more responsive to uh, speed ups and slowdowns in demand. And so while commodity prices will stay volatile, with the U.S. as the swing producer, you should have that, that volatility of supply actually ameliorated over time. Wind and solar, on the other hand, cannot be easily stored. The process for harnessing these renewables is expensive, requires the use of scarce, rare earth metals, largely controlled by China, and is not always available. Therefore, it must be backed up by, you guessed it, hydrocarbons like oil and gas, Renewables are already uh, displacing hydrocarbons, or at least carbons. Uh, today, renewables make up a little over 10% of total energy consumption. That's up from 3% just five or six years ago. 
Renewable growth has been on a 20% tear for the last five years, whereas total uh, demand has grown by less than two. Uh, it, it's really made excellent strides, and everybody in the oil and gas business who's also a consumer thinks that's positive. Um, the problem is, is the displacement. Crude oil doesn't really compete against uh, uh, renewables unless you're talking about, unless you have an electric car, because it's used for electrical power generation. So, so renewables don't displace gasoline or crude oil. They displace natural gas, and they would if it was economic. So working on down the food chain, what they displace primarily is coal. And as I mentioned, uh, natural gas is now used more in power generation than coal for the first time ever. So renewables have a place, but there are places in, in replacing and displacing electrical generation hydrocarbons, which are natural gas and has a carbon coal. But crude oil doesn't have a direct impact at all. The energy density of oil combined with its convenient liquid phase under normal conditions means that it is easily transported from the well to the refinery by rail, thanks to an extensive rail network transports all across the U.S. Between 2008 and 2014 in the U.S., carloads of crude oil transported by rail skyrocket, thanks to increased production from shell plays. In 2014, nearly 1,000 barrels of oil per day were transported by multiple rail carriers over a network of nearly 140,000 miles. Crude oil also is transported by offshore oil tankers from the well to refineries and from refineries to onshore hubs near consumer markets or by truck. This is much easier and more practical than constructing grids across the landscape for solar and wind. Natural gas, while gaseous under normal conditions, is sufficiently energy dense so that pipelines can easily accommodate the flow of gas economically. In the U.S. alone, billions of barrels of crude oil and petroleum products are transported each year by an extensive network of pipelines, and the numbers are growing. In 2014, U.S. Transmission Liquids Pipelines delivered a total of 16.2 billion barrels of petroleum products, including 9.3 billion barrels of crude oil and 6.9 billion barrels of refined products, such as gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and natural gas liquids, including propane and ethanol. In 2014, pipeline operators reported nearly 200,000 miles of liquids pipelines operating in the U.S., this represents an increase of 3.5% over 2013, a 9.5 increase over the last five years, and a 19.5 increase over the last 10 years. This includes 66,649 miles for crude oil, 61,681 miles for refined petroleum products, and 65,595 miles delivering natural gas liquids. From 2010 to 2014, U.S. crude oil pipeline mileage increased by more than 12,000 miles, or 22 percent. Finally, gasoline produced by refining crude oil is efficiently and economically transportable from the refinery to the gas station and available to you, the consumer, 24-7. While refined natural gas and oil power our homes, our places of work, our factories, and allow us to have fun.